Indian National Congress Party. He was a president of the All India Professionals Congress Maharashtra. Has been a TEDx speaker and has addressed enlightened audience at Dell, Columbia Business School, New York, ICICI, Prudential, IBM, University of California, Los Angeles, Axis Bank, Goldman Sachs, Microsoft, Oracle, British Gas, Brookings, the Dune School, and the list continues. He's also a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, the National Herald, and the Daily O of the India Today Group. He's one of the India's top most influencers on social media like Twitter. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Pleasure. Sanjayji, my first question to you, and a very direct question. The Congress party needs a surgical operation, you know, something like a dialysis or a blood transfusion or a cosmetic surgery. Agree or not agree? Agree, totally. Hmm. It could even do with some uh, transplants. With some transplants. And why do you say so? Well, obviously, because the grand old party seems to have uh, developed all kinds of, uh, you know, ailments of late. Uh, hmm. Some of it, of course, is self-inflicted. So I think if the Congress party were to completely re-energize itself, hmm. partly through what you said is a, you know, uh, muscle building, have more protein milkshakes and all oh. that. What but, I meant was directly a blood transfusion. You, you <laughs> need a separate blood only. Yeah. No, no. There is no denying that it needs a massive transfusion of new energy, ideas and you know, aspirations. The party is not fighting hard enough. And it's, it's such an outstanding party with great talent. You know, hmm. supposing if the Congress was one of those parties which has lost all its ideology, its people have left it completely or it has no future, it has no cadres, uh, it has no young people wanting to join the bandwagon, I could understand. But this Like party, one of the regional parties of Maharashtra. Similarly. Yeah, exactly. So this is one of those parties, if it gets its act together, trust mm. me, the Congress is still capable of pulling the rabbit out of the hat. Still capable, you feel? Yeah, yeah. I'm very optimistic. I'm telling you, I've been with the party for a long time. Mm. Uh, there are certain fault lines, but if we fix it, one of mm. them being leadership, I think mm. the party will certainly get its act together. Now, since you mentioned about, you know, people not leaving the party, let, we all know Jyoti Raditya Sindhya, now a cabinet minister in the BJP-led government, Jitin Prasad, another face from the UP. How many more to jump the bus? Yeah, I think these are tragic losses. I think Jyoti Raditya was a phenomenal asset for the party. And we not only lost him, we in the process actually gave away the Madhya Pradesh government to the BJP. Absolutely. Yeah. J Jitin, uh, uh, again, a very nice guy. Uh, someone who, frankly speaking, was fighting for the Congress in a difficult state where we have been wiped out for a long time. Mm. Now, for us to lose talent is, is basically only going to help the BJP because anyone who leaves the Congress is going to mostly join the national alternative. And I feel even Himanta was a bad loss for Assam and the Northeast. So, mm. you know, the time has come for the Congress to really not allow these dissensions to escalate to such a level that they begin to threaten the fundamental mothership. Uh, what happened in Punjab recently is not good news. Rajasthan mm. continues to be rocky. There are issues. The letter, in the letter signed by 23 Congress functionaries as well. Yeah, G23, actually, you know, a lot of people said, you know, they're rebels and dissidents, all crap. I mean, these are all well-meaning Congress people. I mean, Gulam Azad, you know. A Kapil Sibyl, Manish Tiwari, Melin Devra, these are all good, well-meaning people. I mean, everyone has given their entire career to the Congress. Yes. I think the Congress... And they all have been former cabinet ministers as well. Yeah, and former chief ministers like Mr. Huda, Mr. Prithviraj uh, Chavan. So Come I on. think the question is that it, the Congress needs to become that old, vibrant, energetic party. You know, of late, the defeats have made the party extremely demoralized. Hmm. Now then, you know, why is the Congress not able to see the writing on the wall? I mean, where a party has to pamper, I mean, this is the word that I'm getting uh, just in my brain right now, to pamper someone like, uh, with all due respect, Navjot Singh Sidhuji, why is it not understanding the writing on the wall? See, Kalash, the fact is that if people see a vacuum in the leadership, Hmm. Or they feel that at the moment the party is drifting or just floating into nowhere. Hmm. Everyone is going to raise their stakes because they realize, my God, this is a great time for me to try and grab a bigger share of the pie. Hmm. And this is what happens when you don't have a defined, articulated leadership or a political hmm. strategy. That, that's, you know, what you're seeing in Punjab is a consequence hmm. of the fact that there is a limbo at the top. 
So I, I'm just, you know, telling myself that the Congress party recognizes that right now it's not just about the party. You see, mm-hmm. after the pandemic and the terrible mishandling by the government of Mr. Modi, uh, there is an opportunity for the Congress to reposition itself as a governance alternative to India. Mm-hmm. People have seen the BJP and Mr. Modi with due respects to him as, you know, guys who are very high on rhetoric and grandiloquent speeches. Uh, a lot of hyperbole, you mm. know, arousing the masses, you know, the same old majoritarian nationalism, muscular patriotism, and then obviously BJP will always play its bigoted communal propaganda. But mm. the Congress knows all of it. So, mm. Kailash, if you and I were opponents, mm. and I know that you got a great top spin in tennis, I should be ready with my backhand slice. So that's mm. the problem with the Congress, that you should know your opponent so that you are able to defang them when the contest happens. Absolutely. Now, knowing your opponent, 2014, Bharatiya Janta Party came to power. I mean, there was great, what, what I can say, as they say, there was great uh, sentiment against the Congress. I mean, mm-hmm. and after 10 years of rule, that happens in a democracy. And there they saw a leader. There they saw uh, an alternative. 2014 is around the corner. 2019 and 14, we saw that they are more like a presidential elections. I mean, the concept of a parliamentary democracy like the Westminster system that we follow was, I mean, marginalized. 2014 is also around the corner. Uh, The prime minister of the country is still one of the most popular figures in India and the people wish to look at him as, as the leader. Do you feel 2024 will see any alternative? Forget uh, the, the Congress or even from an United Alliance front. There will be some opponent that the public can choose from or no. You know, Kailash, I have actually written a column which said that India does not have a Tina factor, but a Nita factor. And mm. I'm not trying to draw two popular ladies from the Ambani family here. Mm. You know, the Tina family is there is no alternative. And the Nita factor, in my opinion, is 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 the fact that numerous individuals the alternative. Now, in Mm. India, a country of nearly 140 crore people, to believe that there's no leader other than Mr. Modi is to actually insult the collective intelligence of India's entire political ecosystem. You give somebody Mm. a chance, people rise. You know, I think the problem has been that the opposition, including the Congress, has not allowed such an individual to, you know, kind of assume that role. Now, people are talk- people have said that, okay, Rahul did hard, you know, slogged it out, you know, put his entire arsenal out there, but it did not work. Fair enough. In which case, the Congress needs to, you know, put somebody else up front. And, you know, there is no shortage of talent. Now, that's where the Congress has fallen short. Number two, as far as the opposition is concerned, Mamata Banerjee is drawing a lot of credit for having defeated the BGP in West Bengal. But... But there are other leaders too. And I think the question is who it's going to be is a matter of, frankly speaking, the way the opposition gets together. But Mm -hmm. India has today, and just think about it, uh, Kailash, roughly nine chief ministers in the 28, 29 states who are ex-Congress people who have left the Congress and joined the BJP and other parties. So I do believe that until Mr. Modi became prime minister, Many people thought he was just a good enough regional satrap from Gujarat, right? Mm. And uh, Rajiv Gandhi was just a pilot until he became the prime minister, literally. I mean, he had just been an MP for a few years. Mm. Mm. Um, You know, end of day, Dr. Manmohan Singh. I mean, many people criticized the last two years of his reign. But, you know, for a bureaucrat and an economist, he did a wonderful job in UPA 1 for sure. And many of the things in UPA 2 were not bad either. So I do believe that, you know, when you have a political leader given a platform, anybody can shine. I'm not going to take names from my party because I don't want to be playing favorites. That's not my game. But I can tell you this for a fact. The Congress has at least four or five solid, formidable, brilliant people who can both head the party and should the party be in a position to form the government in 2024 with other opposition parties. Why not? Then what is stopping it? Well, I think, you know, just think about it. We lost the Lok Sabha election in 2019. Mm. No sal uh, We don't even uh, have a president uh, who's been properly or transparently elected. You know, it's like, it's like you mm. are not the managing director of governance now from tomorrow for two years because you take a sabbatical 
and you mm. go to Himalayas for meditation. If mm. for two years governance now doesn't have an MD, how is the company going to grow? Mm. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's absurd. Mm. It's preposterous. And these mm. are the mistakes that the Congress Congress Party has made. You know, mm. nobody is willing to take a decision on mm. elections of the Congress Working Committee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now we are tired of saying this a million times. But mm. you know, the Congress Party has to wake up and smell the coffee because people are at the moment, in my opinion, very much open for change. Mm. And they are saying that we would like to see the Congress and the opposition pose an alternative narrative. What are we waiting for? We are giving the BJP a walk in the park. Absolutely. I mean, and uh, as, as you said that, you know, but... There's one sentiment that goes around in India as well during election that voting is never for someone. It is always against someone. Uh, so, that is also true. Yeah. That is also true. Now you think about it, that in 2014, the verdict was against the Congress. I don't think it was so much a vote for Narendra Modi or the BJP. It was a vote. There was a huge the- anti-incumbency factor and people saw a great alternative in the prime minister. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They saw an alternative in him because, you know, he began to speak when the Congress was not even willing to you know, kind of engage with the people. I mean, uh, right on from Dr. Manmohan Singh to Mrs. Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi, they all avoided the media. They barely engaged with the common man. We paid a price. We paid mm-hmm. a price. But it was a vote against the UPA's you know, last two years of so-called policy paralysis and corruption allegations that the Congress just did not handle well. Mm-hmm. But 2019, despite a terrible economy, Demonetization disaster, record unemployment, huge rural distress, hmm. failed foreign policy, tongue, you know, Mehul Choksi and Nirav Modi corruption, Rafael in the news. How did Mr. Modi actually increase the number of seats? Now, a lot of analysts attribute that to the Pulwana, Pulwama or the Balakot bump. Fair enough. But, you know, the BJP will always exploit that, you know, that that majoritarian nationalism, uh, you know, pitch. But mm. the fact of the matter is that the opposition itself should have been prepared for that. Mm. You see, if you don't understand the language of politics, which is mm. communication, mm. you're mm. not going to be able to beat the BJP because their social media, their control on mainstream television is massive. And then they have a leader like Mr. Modi who is able to captivate audiences. You can't take that away from him. So you're saying that BJP controls the media? BJP has a massive control on big media. I mean, by big media, I mean the popular mainstream television channels are Mm. greatly under the pressure of the government. Now, when I say control, what I mean is two things. Number Mm. one, Mm. many of them, obviously, I think, get substantial government advertising because they they survive a lot on advertising revenue. But Mm. don't don't ignore the fact that there are many who are scared of some kind of retribution if they take on the government, we have seen how many journalists in this country have been harassed and you know harangued. And mm. then you have uh, then you have a very strong social media army that is spreading fake news on Twitter and Facebook. And then now they are exploiting WhatsApp. So if you are not able to attack the BGP on all fronts, including mm. having a very popular and a you know a brilliant communicator, trust mm. me, that's the reason why people say that the opposition is not ready to take on the government. Sure. Uh, some time ago, Prashant Kishore, I mean, the political strategist who again smelt victory in Bengal, met a lot of uh, Congress leaders, including uh, Shrimati Sonia Gandhi ji, Sharad Pawar ji. Do you feel that he'll be able to manage to get all the opposition folks together? Well, you know, I was there at the Rashtra Manch meeting that happened at uh, Mr. Sharad Pawar's home in Delhi. And um, so, you know, I can share with you this much. A lot, they have already made a public disclosure of what was discussed. But Kailash, I think everybody was convinced that Mm. India is not likely to forget what they've gone through since March of 2020. You know, Mm. we have, look at India's statistics. Over 4 lakh dead, 31 million people affected, many people dying when they didn't have to die. You know, lack of oxygen supply, not enough vaccines, hmm. dead bodies floating down the Ganga, people not having an ICU bed. I think, I don't know about you, this has been a psychological nightmare for India. Are hmm. people going to ever forget the second wave? I don't think so that after second wave, any family 
uh, knows of any family who has not lost someone. I mean, we yeah. all know of uh, of someone of of close relatives or or immediate relatives or friends who have lost someone. Yeah, and and you know, let me tell you, it's devastating because I think the state failed the citizens, and and uh, you know, frankly. this was the same government that was congratulating itself in the month of january saying hey india is through and we are an example to the whole world mm. i think the reason why mr modi and the bjp need to be voted out in 2020 is because their political hubris and their mm. administrative incompetence has cost innocent lives to go and i think every human life matters right every human life matters and do you feel Absolutely. that the government i mean uh, see india i mean uh, it's not uh, we, we should make an apple to apple comparison in india cannot be compared to a new zealand or an israel because on 21st of june when government again took back the vaccination from the states it inoculated more than uh, 8.1 million people that is now double of new zealand and an equivalent to israel so but still 8.1 million as compared to 138 crores or 1380 million will, will still be very less so i mean we have inoculated close to 400 million people the recovery rate is also now fantastic most of the states apart from kerala most of the states are below 10000 in terms of active cases daily then where do you see the government failing uh, in ta- tackling the second wave well i mean uh, as you answered it yourself the government did not prepare for the second wave number one it had virtually started celebrating the fact that india has defeated the covid after january 2021 and mm. that in my opinion was an act of criminal negligence i mean think about it no vaccines in a country that manufactures the largest amount of vaccines in the world 60% mr modi says this is the pharmacy of the world and you had people who had to return back even today look at the numbers look at the numbers they're not good enough i mean the fact is that you did not boost your own vaccine production you did not even arrange for oxygen supplies um mm. you know death figures of data of death and this is not just bjp across the country have been fabricated and fudged what kind of morality is this and i'll tell you where the government failed the government failed because it would have taken elementary knowledge to see what was happening in america and the uk and europe to know that this is likely to come back again because you opened up the economy you opened up society but you have not reached herd immunity so mm. i think this was a horrendous error and i i believe if any was in responsible for the monumental mammoth disaster that india has gone through it is this government it is this government and you know think about it that today you have a situation where people in india are not yet confident that the, that the government of the day can give them a vaccination on a given time that has been promised people are still returning back from vaccination centers now hmm. this is unacceptable and therefore i'm going to say this that when we look at our numbers look at how many people are fully vaccinated in our country hmm and at even if we have vaccinated say 30 crore people today i i, I believe that's the number 40 crore so 40 crore how much is it around 40 crore yeah so there's still you're still 30% right and you're talking mm. single dose on mm. double dose on double dose you're probably not even 6 crore double. yeah roughly roughly so you're you're almost talking of like uh, less than 5% so it's a long long way to go so do you believe that you know government set a target ambitious target that from july to december 216 million doses 216 crore i'm sorry 216 crore doses and india will be inoculated complete do you feel that it will achieve that well no, if you look at the current rates there's no chance at all i mean they, you need to average around 7 and a half to 8 uh, per day to get there so mm. the shortfall is increasing and you know even a sputnik is not here yet pfizer or moderna no, no. Or johnson and johnson have not even made an entry you know there's an indemnity clause issue which is stuck with the government well i i really don't know what sense is it are why are we acting so patriotic save lives i mean mm. for god's sake if the same if the same vaccine is good for an american or a britisher why will it not be good for us so i think these are all ridiculous postures being taken by a government that essentially surrendered governance 
which is what your program is all about and which is why india has paid with lives innocent lives and don't forget one thing kalash every one family death means a minimum 10 to 15 people in the extended family who bear the brunt of that emotional deprivation so Absolutely. 4 lakh people dead means 40 lakh people who have probably not slept well for several months mm. i mean who is responsible for this i think mm. we need to ask questions on accountability and right now we are not even talking about people who have lost jobs in urban india hmm i was coming people to are, people who are hopelessly out of small business hmm mental health are we even calculating these uh, mammoth financial disasters i mean post covid complications are so much that people have developed anxiety depression long covids be it blood pressure cholesterol i mean there there are uh, which is completely not in human kind because no one knew the nature of the virus Yeah. Now you are a Mumbai car, and and I came to know of this just before the show started. The Mumbai model is something which the Supreme Court of India admired. The U.S. Congress sent a letter to Mumbai Municipal Commissioner uh, Iqbal Singh Chahal ji about uh, the way M- uh, Mumbai contained COVID, looking at the density of the population and the fact that social distancing is just not po- possible in a city like uh, Mumbai. How do you rate the Mumbai model? Well, I think did well, uh, given the fact that at one point in April we touched eleven thousand cases. More than twelve, yes. Yeah, and and now we are down to somewhere around five hundred or six hundred. So you know it did well. However, I do believe that uh, Mumbai will remain susceptible because of the density of the population, and until mm. people are vaccinated, Mumbai will remain vulnerable. Because mm. you 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 know we both live in Mumbai, right? Mm. And you can see that people are always at close proximity. There is no space in our city. We are one big concrete labyrinth jungle, and mm. therefore our challenge is that until people are vaccinated at a rapid pace, you know, mm. it will just take one super spreader event, and we are in trouble. You know, I do believe one of the reasons why Mr. Modi's government need, is morally responsible for the spread mm. of the virus. was because of the kumbh mela and you know you had millions coming there who mm. came and attended the kumbh mela and mm. they went to different parts of india because they were religiously committed to you know mm. taking the holy dip in the haridwar and the government of uttarakhand and the central government preponed the event it was meant to be next year they preponed it can you believe that i mean mm. at the time when people were worried about the pandemic they preponed the event by a year mm. they put out full page advertisements and the chief minister of the state said hame bhagwan pe bharosa hai hamare awam ko kuch nahi hoga bhagwan unki raksha karenge now if you have such absurdity atrocious mm. Mm. and ridiculous statements been made by political bosses of the bjp mm. god help us god help us now talking about unemployment since you touched upon on one hand the sensex crossed the 50000 mark economy uh, slowed down but sensex crossed the 50000 mark uh, a very big uh, food delivery startup 10000 crore ipo got just subscribed in a few hours on day 1 and on the other hand unemployment is just all time high the disparity has increased Well, Kalash, that will just explain to you that there's a big difference between Main Street and Wall Street, or Main Street and Dalal Street. You know, mm. I can tell you the stock markets react very differently to what is actually happening at the ground level. You know, one of mm. the reasons why the stock markets are booming is because there is excess of global uh, liquidity, and you know, a lot of hot money will find its way into Indian markets. But the fact mm. remains that markets are not a barometer of where you are headed. Although I believe um, Mr. Junjunwala is extremely optimistic about where India is headed. Now, surely, if you have not seen any V-shaped economic recovery yet, I mean, mm. auto sales are erratic. You still have people suffering in the uh, in urban poverty, and uh, like it or not, even the sale of durables and many other items that reflect the state of the economy, you can see there is still a lot of uh, the sentiment on consumer confidence is extremely low. So at mm. this point. unless the government were to put money in the pockets of people how do you going to expect the economy to boom you have a demand problem and what the government is doing is trying to boost supply through giving them tax uh, breaks and bank guarantees for loans that's not the way forward 
I mean, that is indirect money. Mm. We need uh, what US did. Many economists say that you know US just pumped in money yeah. into the house of uh, into individuals as well as MSMEs. And yeah. uh, the Indian uh, way of handling was uh, an indirect uh, support or a help or, or a collateral, not that sort. Yeah. Now we had a new cabinet, Cabinet 2.0. How do you rate the cabinet on four points? I'll say A, merit. Was well, merit awarded in cabinet 2.0 according to you? Well, I think I wish the government good luck. I mean, they needed some, some good people in there. How do they perform? I have no idea. I hmm. believe some of the people who have joined the cabinet have uh, interesting qualifications. But I also read that 42% of them have uh, criminal uh, charge sheets against them. So, you know, it all depends ultimately upon how they perform. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at Mr. Modi's government, it runs entirely by the PMO. So mm. it doesn't matter who's the cabinet minister, the prime minister takes the biggest calls and the mm. bureaucrats are extremely powerful. So whether mm. the government performs or not, we will only have to watch in the months ahead. But most of the changes were really done with the elections of 2022 in mind. Yeah, but my second sub, sub, sub section, how do you rate the cabinet? As per B, politics. Well, you know, I, I can tell you that in politics, you have to do a balancing act. I think even we did mm. it in the Congress. We need to give representation to women, to various castes and states and so on. That is a hard uh, uh, real politic that has to be played. And which is one of the reasons why in a parliamentary democracy, you don't get good governance, unlike a presidential democracy where you can get whoever you like. So mm. I do believe that uh, one will have to wait and see. Uh, in my opinion, the economy is critical at the moment and uh, the health and education departments are important. But the very fact that Mr. Modi sacked both the health ministers told you that that was a public admission of the fact that they had failed in managing the COVID. Now, rating of the same cabinet, subsection C, which is inclusion, 27 OBCs, 12 scheduled caste, 8 scheduled tribes. What you does know, it mean? You know, inclusive politics means representing all the communities in this country. I'll give you one example. Just watch the data of Uttar Pradesh in the last two assembly elections. Uttar Pradesh, if it was a country, would be the sixth largest country in the world. Absolutely. Okay. After Indonesia. 20% of the population there is Muslims. Hmm. The BJP does not even give one ticket for an assembly to a Muslim. This party has no moral right to even use the word inclusive. Mm. And last is women empowerment. Well, I do feel that, you know, women in this country have so far got a raw deal from mm. all parties concerned. And I therefore feel that it is about time that the BJP and the Congress pioneered the Women's Reservation Bill in Parliament. You know, mm. until legislation changes mm. and women believe they can pick up the phone and talk to a uh, you know, a, a Maya Vati or a Mamata Banerjee or a Manika Gandhi or a Priyanka Gandhi Vadra or, or a Smriti Irani, and, and then uh, all the women are accountable to them, things don't change. You know, when you see people in positions of power, they make you believe that they will look after my interest. Why mm. is the parliament not passed the 33% women's reservation bill? I think all the men in the Rasa Sabha and Lok Sabha owe an explanation to the women of this country. Hmm. Fuel prices have skyrocketed, more than 100 in the metros, touching about 100 in tier 2, tier 3 towns. Is the government sensitive to people's misery? I think the government is cold, callous, cunning and calculating. Just think hmm. about it, uh, Kailash. When the prices go up, they come and say, we can't help it. The global crude oil prices are going high. Fair enough. Mm. then why doesn't it go down when the global crude oil prices are going down? So it's like a heads I win, tails you lose. Mm. And guess what? Through excise duties, mm. they make roughly 5 lakh crore a year. It's a lot of money. Where does mm. that money go? But and government has to support uh, expenditure also or infrastructure. The government has, has spent uh, close to 35,000 crore on, on vaccination. There is health infrastructure. Where will the government get money from? Kailash, I want to ask the government this question. Are mm. you transparent? 
If the price goes up, you please charge us more. We have no problem. The last will pay. I will pay. Everybody will pay. But when the price goes low, they still charge you more. Hmm. I mean, how fraudulent can you be? I mean, this is political immorality at its worst. And I tell you the worst thing about oil prices. If you allowed that money to be in the pockets of the common man, you would spend it. That's a demand you need. Mm-hmm. Increasing prices on oil is inflationary. And don't you realize that, Kailash, that today the poorest man in this country and the richest man, whether it's Gautam Adani or Mr. Anil Ambani or Mr. Mukesh Ambani, pay the same amount for a liter of petrol or diesel. Mm. It's regressive. It creates inequality. Mm. Last question. Where do you see yourself in politics? Any plan to take the saffron dwaj in hand? No, I, you see, I am an old-fashioned guy where ideological values are concerned. I'm mm. very modern in terms of my approach to liberalism and progressive politics. But I believe India cannot abandon liberalism democracy, secularism, and its constitutional values. So I'm, mm. a, I'm a big fan of Gandhi Nehru, and I believe the Congress needs to modernize the Gandhi Nehru thinking into practical politics. You know, Mahatma Gandhi actually used principles to play politics. Mm. Today, unfortunately, all parties, including the Congress, play politics and ignore the principles. So I think you're going to reverse that game. So the question of me joining the BJP doesn't arise. But... Since you asked me, I'm going to give you a very upfront question, which might be, I'm going public for the first time with it. I've so far never contested an election because mm. I chose not to, because to be very frank, I never wanted to handle black money. Mm. I'm, I'm a son of a very modest middle-class professor mm. who never in my, in my whole life, he never, I think, got one pie of illegal income into his home. Mm. And one of the things I learned from my dad was do what you have to, but you know, don't ever compromise what you stand for. Hmm. By, by saying that I may contest an election doesn't mean that I'm going to marry black money, not at all. But hmm. I will fight an election and I'll fight it on legitimate sources that will be publicly disclosed. And hmm. I do hope that in 2024, I will be a figure that hopefully we'll have a lot to talk about. Chalo. All, the, all, the, all the very best to you for that and all our good wishes from governance now. And also thank you so much for joining on this episode of Visionary Talks by Governance Now. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, also for joining us on this episode. Thank you so much, Sanjay Ji. It was a complete pleasure.